Hey everybody. Thank you very much SFL for having me here and thank you all for coming uh, today. So just to level set, I just want to make sure I'm in the right room. Uh, are there any communists here or fascists? Like raise your hands. Nobody, okay. So just making sure. Who's in favor of free trade? Everybody? Okay, is everybody in favor of property rights? Okay, low or no taxes? All right, okay, okay. So we're all on the same page with almost all these things. Competition, competition. Okay, so I wanna congratulate you because you are all more than halfway there to being experts in free market climate policy. Because it turns out that the essential problem in climate, if you look at it from a 30,000 foot perspective, is innovation acceleration, right? None of the technologies are good enough. On the one hand, you have the fossil fuels with the emission objection. On the other hand, you have a lot of clean technologies with dispatchability problems and a whole host of other issues. Does nuclear have a business model that works? You know, you can go on and on with the problems on both sides. Everything needs to get better. So what's the fastest way to accelerate innovation? Freedom, yes, you win. Uh, free markets, globally, since the Enlightenment, freedom has been the biggest driver of innovation that we have. Uh, it's the free trade is the way to spread innovation around the world. It's the way to reduce the cost of clean technologies by sourcing them. Competition is decarbonization. There's a great study in the United States by Wayne Weingarten that shows that if you look at the competitive energy markets in the United States versus the monopoly markets, the competitive energy markets are actually decarbonizing 66% faster. So they're, you know, across the board, and we will tell you about more solutions in a little bit, but <clears throat> you know, before I get to what we're doing about this, you know, let me just say that you know, I come from a, a philanthropic point of view and a philanthropic tradition uh, where the Richardson Foundations have been involved in funding the free market movement for many, many decades. And the game plan uh, for the Smith Richardson Foundation back in the 60s and 70s that led to all of the ideas behind the Reagan revolution, there was a simple, simple idea, which was always address the issues of the day with a better free market solution, okay? And when we started the Grace Richardson Fund program to look at this thing, you know, we, we said, okay, w the, the Grace Richardson Fund is a small, uh, foundation, and so we could only really take on a limited set of things. So what were we going to focus on where we had the biggest bang for the buck? The biggest bang for the buck is the area that other people are ignoring, uh, usually. And the area that was really being ignored was climate by the free market side for very many reasons. The, you had you know, an, an emphasis on denialism or skepticism. You had a lot of criticism of left-wing policy, but what that ends up doing at the end of the day, is that you end up, uh, you know, if you're, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? And the, and the uh, uh, free market side of the fence has lost the argument big time at the national and international level on climate policy. And we're facing a wave of erosion of freedom from bad climate policy. The, the IRA in the United States, the European Green Deal, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, a lot of stuff that's in the Paris Accord. So <clears throat> we, uh, we developed a lot of free market climate policy ideas uh, over the years, and we'll get to, get to that in a second, but the, the, you know, the, the, the basic question that we asked in a workshop yesterday, which was the same that we asked in a workshop at LibertyCon in Europe a year ago, is what would a free market international climate agreement look like? What, what, what would this look like? And basically, the answer is global free market streamlining for innovation acceleration. So the payoff of potentially focusing on this is huge because this is an issue where you can do jujitsu on the, uh, the climate alarmism, left-wing policy uh, establishment. Because of all this desire to do something about climate change, you know, you can actually take all that energy and say, well, look, 
uh, is now plain to many people, even on the center left, that you know, traditional climate policy is failing on its own terms, utterly failing. You look at, at things like uh, uh, you know, the European ETS, uh, the emissions trading system. This was supposed to be a wonderful, uh, economically efficient way to reduce emissions. Well, it's nothing but a, a, a mess of unintended consequences. You know, you have the political uh, you know, favors being given out to some uh, companies who are politically connected. They get free uh, passes on emissions. And then you have, uh, you know, uh, companies that have, uh, uh, you know, that, that are pursuing climate solutions that have no benefit, that are getting some of these offset subsidies. And then because of all the burdens on European industry, there's no more industry being built in, in Europe. It's all being factories that are in other countries that are, have lower standards, so you have higher emissions for the products that are being re-imported. And there are transportation emissions. So they're raising emissions, losing, losing their competitiveness. It's failing on their own terms, and their solution is what? A carbon border adjustment mechanism, a carbon tariff. So they're basically saying, we've shot ourselves in the foot. We failed on our own terms, and our solution is to shoot everybody else in the foot, too. Not a great idea. So, we're proposing a solution here, but, you know, and, and this, the, the solutions that we're proposing are based in uh, uh, an analysis of free market policies from before the era in which climate change uh, was even known about. Uh, you know, we, uh, we just did a, uh, shot a video uh, with Students for Liberty, Learn, the Learn Liberty video series on the seven unintended uh, consequences, the, well, the seven, uh, well, actually seven free market policies with unintended climate benefits. So this is from the era before the, the early 1990s when people really didn't know about climate change. And there was a free market explosion, you know, uh, post-World uh, post War II through the 1990s uh, and to tell you about it, uh, I'm going to bring up on stage Reem Ibrahim, uh, who is from perhaps the oldest free market think tank in the world, the uh, Institute for Economic Affairs in London, the granddaddy of them all. Uh, and she's working with, has worked as the narrator for this video for Students for Liberty. And she's going to tell you a little bit about that video and some of those past free market policies. So Reem, please come on up uh, and tell us about uh, all that. Welcome, Reem, please. Go ahead. Hello, how's everyone doing? Good? Woo! <laughs> Amazing. So, as Rod said, my name is Reem. I'm from the Institute of Economic Affairs. And uh, I'm here today to talk to you guys a little bit about what will be, a little teaser, for what will be in the Learn Liberty videos uh, that I've re been recording over the last few days uh, for Learn Liberty, which is particularly interesting. So, I'm going to be super duper quick here. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the way in which we talk about unintended consequences when it comes to free market solutions. So climate change, I think, is one of the biggest, most important issues that are facing, especially my generation in this world. And yet, continuously, people seem to think that the solution is more government. People want to uh, advocate for green subsidies for various different industries that then potentially might not be there to support those kind of technological advancements. But if we rewind a little bit and look at history, history does tell us that actually, as we expand free markets, as we allow competition to occur, and as we allow businesses to innovate, we see fantastic benefits for the climate. So just a little bit of an example, after World War II, that kind of free trade consensus that we saw uh, as a result of different members, member states sort of coming together and trading with one another, we actually saw that the Japanese and the German uh, sort of car industries were able to decarbonize more efficiently, and that then resulted, as a result of the, the new amounts 
of free trade, it then resulted in the decarbonisation of effectively the global auto industry. So a, hu a huge amount of impact there as a result of kind of these kind of decarbonisation efforts that were occurring in individual nations. As they're allowed to trade with one another and cooperate with the rest of the world, we saw huge climate benefits for the rest of the world's global industries. Another example, take in the 1980s when uh, AT&T in the US was uh, broken up, it was a court order to break it up, and this kind of deregulation effectively meant that we saw huge amounts of technological advancements that then resulted in lower carbon emissions. So even just taking, for example, um, the smartphone that I'm reading my notes on right now, the smartphone eliminated emissions that you know, result from things like fax machines and beepers and calculators. So all of these different elements of products that were then able to come together as a result of technological advancements. And as Rod said earlier, the best way in order for us to innovate and see these kind of technological advancements really seek fruition is through allowing and effectively igniting the free market and allowing people to have those choices and allowing the market to compete with one another as well. <coughs> so, just thinking about the way in which free trade has helped, so sort of, when we're talking about supply siders, and the supply siders, especially with regard to the third way Democrats in the sort of 80s and 90s, those kind of deregulated markets meant that they all agreed with one another on how low, low pro-growth tax cuts actually then allow for the market to work, but then also have these incredible decarbonizing impacts. So when we talk about unintended consequences, they're not always bad especially when it comes to the expansion of freedom. Even, again, looking at the way in which natural gas then converted into the sort of, sort of fracking revolution from 1970 to 1990, the average annual US vehicle's CO2 emissions had dropped by 62%. So we know that the solution to climate change is not more government. It is actually allowing for businesses to compete with one another and introduce those technological advancements that really allow for us to effectively then end the kind of climate change impacts that we're seeing. So if we want to help solve climate change and collaborate with one another globally, the solution is the expansion of freedom. Thank you. <clears throat> So thank you very much, Reem. And Reem will be joining our panel discussion at, at 2.40 after this. Uh, she's not on the program, but uh, how could we not have her on the panel? Uh, so in any event, uh, you know, basically the, the, um, the lessons from history, you know, especially if you look at the, the supply side era of uh, the Reagan administration, the basic game plan uh, was to uh, deregulate uh, large portions of the economy. They deregulated telecoms, transportation, natural gas, uh, the power markets, uh, uh, airlines, and, and a bunch of other things too. And then all of the new opportunities that are created are funded with supply side tax policy. Basically, policies that reduce the cost of investment. One of the things that they found out by reducing the cost of investment, simply bringing down the cost of investment, increases the cycle of new technologies being put in place and old technologies being taken out. The new stuff is nearly always cleaner than the old. So those supply side tax cuts were actually decarbonizing while being technologically neutral. That's especially true of policies like full expensing, capital expensing if you know what that is. So the accord, the Climate and Freedom Accord straw proposal, which grew out of a number of different workshops that occurred from 2016 uh, up to uh, 2020. Uh, uh, these different, uh, worked on different pieces of the puzzle. This all comes together in the accord in a series of, of free market proposals. But the basic deal that's being proposed in the, in the accord is a global replay of the 1981 uh, supply cider policy open up markets and have supply side tax cuts that, that are intentionally now focused not just on growth, but also on decarbonization through the same mechanism. So the way that the accord proposes doing this is something called co-victory bonds, loans, and savings accounts. And these are basically tax exempt debt for property, plant, and equipment. It does the same thing that capital expensing, full expensing does. It reduces the cost of capital, the cost of new investments for PP&E. And by doing that, 
you increase investment, you increase jobs, you increase growth, you increase supply, you bring down inflation by doing that, but you also accelerate that process across the board in a technologically neutral way of accelerating the process of technological innovation. So there are, the basic deal is basically, you're, you're, this is a, a very unusual instrument that was suggested by a professor at Columbia named Travis Bradford a few years ago, uh, which, which is, uh, when you put it into this context, it's not just an incentive for decarbonization, but it's an incentive for freedom and free markets. And if we're going to incentivize anything, shouldn't it be freedom and free markets, right? So there are a couple of other ideas along those lines of equity side things you can do that promote growth and decarbonization in the agreement. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion talking about what the different free market groups that have gotten involved in this are doing. Uh, you know, we'll be hearing from Agata Strmetka from Poland who's talking about what the Warsaw Enterprise Institute is doing with six other think tanks. What her boss, Michael Sololov, is doing with his investments in small modular nuclear reactors in this, in, in this field. Uh, the, the Institute for Free Trade, uh, Dan Hannon's uh, organization in the UK, Rob Armstrong is the director, he'll be talking about the new study they're doing about how these instruments can expand free trade relations with the UK, and also uh, build business for the City of London Financial District. Uh, we'll be talking about how these are flexible instruments that can be used for multiple purposes, like uh, rebuilding Ukraine, uh, like rebuilding Gaza, like uh, uh, you know, uh, providing sustainable development uh, funding for the Global South. Um, how, for instance, Javier Malay might use them to attract foreign investment to Argentina uh, while uh, simultaneously fighting inflation there. In fact, the Argentinian Taxpayers Association was one of the groups uh, that is a, a, a involved with us who are introducing these ideas to the Malay administration uh, as we speak. Uh, we'll be talking about the series of workshops that will be happening uh, at other freedom-oriented uh, uh, conferences around the world, uh, the Atlas Liberty Forums and Costa Rica, Madrid, Tanzania, New Delhi. Uh, so you'll hear a lot if you come uh, from a lot of interesting people if you come uh, at 2.40. But anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate, I think I'm at the end of my time, uh, but if there's time, I'd be happy to entertain some questions if there are one or two about any of this. Anybody? Yeah. Sir. Question, please. Yes, I'd like you to comment on uh, the position of, uh, of David Friedman, who said um, there is a blind spot for all the benefits of global warming. And we are, so people are only focusing on the negative consequences, but completely ignoring the positive consequences. And there's no reason to believe that the negative ones are going to be bigger than the positive ones. Sure. Uh, the. Uh you know, the, I, I'm aware of David Friedman's uh, argument. Uh, I had a debate with him in, in Lisbon, uh, at the end of which he had a nosebleed and had to retire. He's literally true. Uh, <laughs> but but the, uh, 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 essentially, we know that climate change is going to have catastrophic impacts on some people. Uh, and it is predictable that there might be climate benefits for some people as well. Uh, and it appears very strongly that there will be some benefits, but the, the catastrophic, uh, you know, uh, 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 potential for some people at very least uh, argues for uh, at least uh, moderating that change. But in, it, in any event, I would have to say that uh, if you're a free marketeer, then it really doesn't matter whether climate change is real or not because the benefits to free markets from addressing this issue with free market uh, solutions are so great that they should outweigh the other, any other consideration you might have. You know, because if you can stave off bad left-wing policy and institute good policy that opens up markets, that's the biggest win for free markets that we could possibly have in our lifetime. So 
I, I think that this is a particular issue where there, the win, the potential win, the bang for the buck, is so much greater for uh, liberty movement activists who get involved. The potential to work together with other liberty movement activists across borders, for young people to get involved and work together comprehensively to put together a free market framework internationally is unparalleled. And you know, students for liberty, the students who are here, should consider this perhaps the most productive use of their time as, as liberty activists, and the donors in the room should get involved as well and stop ignoring this issue because they're, they're, they're leaving the table and it's resulting in the erosion of freedom uh, for uh, the liberty movement. Can I, can I just add to that very quickly? I don't know if this, this is Please. working. Please. Um, I mean, I, I'm a big David Friedman fan, and I think that it's, it, you know, whether or not that is the truth or not, and whether or not we know uh, if, if climate change will actually yield positive or negative benefits overall, doesn't necessarily matter because the global consensus at the moment is that the solution to climate change is more government and that the solution to climate change is subsidizing green industries, it's governments picking winners and losers, it's governments being involved in the market in that way. And so whether or not there will be positive or negative potential benefits that yield as a result of uh, climate change and as a result of global warming doesn't necessarily matter because we have to push the narrative and actually show show that the solution overall and the way in which we receive those tech, we, we actually achieve those technological advancements is through the expansion of freedom. And at the moment, that is not the global consensus, but we have to do all of the hard work to ensure that it is. Thank you very much, Reem. Thank you, and we'll continue the conversation in Salon A. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.